Test message, make sure Ken can hear you. Ha. Testing, one, two, three, testing. Perfect. All right. Okay, it is the bottom of the hour. I'd like to call this meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society of Order. Um, I am Diane Hall, your president, and for the first time in years, we can do an actual roll call. Take it away, Bob. I'm Bob Tremblay. Hi, I'm your first vice president. Marty, there in the front row. Marty Coons, former president. We've got Adrian. David Boransky, former VP. Oh, We've got switch the uh it's cool. We have we're we're good. We got some new people. Carol, hi Carol. Hi. Fabulous. Hello. Chris Hey Chris. Gary Rapallo. Hey Gary. Bill Beers. Hey Bill. Kevin McLaughlin. Kevin our <laughs> outreach guy. And Ken. Yep. Fabulous. Okay, for the newcomers, how'd you find out about us? Dr. Parton. I'm taking a second. Dr. Dale Parton. Awesome. Okay. So uh, for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, we do a business portion of the meeting, then we do observing reports, and then we do um, a short presentation followed by a little uh, bio break and then a long feature presentation. And then if you want to join us, we will uh, carry on the conversation at the Red Coat Tavern, which is located on Woodward just north of 13 Mile over in Royal Oak. So if you're up for that, uh, we, I uh, usually spend an hour, an hour and a half, uh, you know, having a drink, having a burger, having some fries, whatever, and talking astronomy or whatever. It's, uh, we call it gastronomy, and it's something that we have missed very much in these last couple of years. All right, so, presidential report. Oh, this is our second meeting. We had a few hiccups with the live stream last year, which we are in the process of working out. Thanks to the Cranbrook staff and Adrian and Bob. So uh, hopefully the live stream will go a little better this time. Otherwise, we will continue doing the virtual only Macomb meetings until their academic year starts up again in September. However, between now and September, we have some exciting stuff, including our picnic. The picnic is going to be the final weekend of August, a Saturday at Stargate. It's going to be the traditional format with the uh, board will be providing the dogs, burgers, vegetarian equivalents thereof, the buns, condiments, and the soft drinks. If you come, we ask you to bring uh, a dessert or a side dish to share. We will be starting the dinner at 5 p.m. there at the shelter, and uh, we'll keep going until either we get clouded out or everybody's too tired to observe. So hopefully we'll have an observing session following the actual picnic. So um, do look out for uh, a flyer that's going to be in the next two issues of the WASP. But in the meantime, mark your calendars, last Saturday in August, picnic time. We also have a calendar committee. It is not too early to be submitting your astrophotography images and drawings to a Dale team at publications who will be putting together the calendar committee to make another fabulous calendar of all original Warren Astronomical Society images. So uh, we want to try to get those in earlier than usual because we want to be able to put the calendars in people's hands um, in December, preferably, maybe even earlier. So if you got pictures, send them in. Uh, the board has been discussing um, the use of the John Root bequest that we will be putting towards a third building at Stargate. So the Stargate committee has taken that up. Um, Riyadh can't be here in person tonight, but that will be on the agenda of the next meeting of the Stargate committee is where the new building needs to go. This would be the, the combination of warming room roll off observatory that we've talked about for quite some time and uh, really would like to see motion on this time. Okay. Um, I think that's it for presidential business. So Bob, why don't you give it a whirl while I pull up Riyadh's report? Okay. 
Um, yeah, um, tonight I'm giving a presentation, a short presentation on the decadal survey. I'm actually I'm giving an overview because I'm going to be giving uh, presentations on it for the next couple months. Um, our, our speaker tonight is going to be talking about the Worldwide Telescope. It is both a web app and an installable app that um, it's pretty darn cool. I've been using it every week in my posts. I have a present presenter for uh, our Macomb meeting. She's going to be coming in from Ireland and she does astronomical drawing and does a whole lot of outreach with kids. Uh, her website, she's got a list that long of associations that she's been with and awards and stuff. So I spoke with her to do a tech check and she's absolutely delightful. So can't wait for that. Yes. Um, Third Thursday online. Yep. All Maco meetings are going to be online for the next three months. Yep. Yeah, we, we don't usually have a room uh, for the summer months because uh, they're not in session. So when they're not in session, we tend to get a room in the basement that would not be suitable for distancing, hosting more than a handful of people. So we're just going to keep doing that online until we get our normal room back in September. Okay, um, Riyadh is, is working late tonight, so he was able to join us for the board meeting, but he asked that I read his uh, highlights of his Stargate report. So the 28th of May, uh, the observatory opened, but the sky was cloudy and did not improve. Yet we had 20 members of the general public there at Stargate. Um, some of them expressed interest in joining the club. Most of the activities uh, were looking at the equipment since there was nothing to observe. Talking to Riyadh, getting your questions answered. We have two new pieces of equipment deployed at Stargate. Actually, they're in the safe right now, but they're available to use. The uh, two times 54 millimeter ultra wide field binoculars and the new ZWO atmospheric dispersion corrector. And uh, so Riyadh's uh, been definitely uh, upgrading our facility and manning the dome and would like to see as many of y'all as possible this upcoming fourth Saturday. Uh, it's going to be June 25th, starting at 7.30 p.m. to account for the fact that it doesn't really get dark until 11 o'clock now. All right, that's enough for me for right now. So if the remaining officers could come on up and do their reports, starting with Adrian, take it away. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, this report's gonna be really quick. All of the financials are in the WASP. As usual, I uh, thank both Mark Ketzier and Dale Timmy for um, helping with some of the minutia of the treasury. The only other announcement to make is for Astronomical League, time is running out. If you wanna be an Astronomical League member, um, they renew the Astronomical League um, memberships basically in the end of june all the way through the end of june the next year so if you haven't already included the seven dollars fifty cents astronomical um, league dues fee in your membership renewal you can just send seven dollars fifty cents um and then we can add you to the list that we'll send to the astronomical league saying these are the members for 2022 to 2023. So consider being an Astronomical League member. Um, the website, I think it's, um, it's just AL Con or Astro League, Bob, you have to help me on that, um, dot org or just Google Astronomical League to see programs they're doing. That includes um, every Tuesday night with Explore Scientific, there's a global star party that they host. And I'm a part of it as well as David Levy, who's not with us, We're gonna, I'm going to have to tell him, come back. We figured it out. Um, we, he can uh, come and give his observation reports. Um, so with that, that's it for Treasury. Any questions, just come find me. And um, next, uh, who do we have next? Mark. Mark, come on down. Sure, sweet. So by the time we get up there, we'll be on. Oh, oh. Main minutes are in the June loss. That's all I know. 
Minutes are in the wasp. There you go. All right. Outreach with Kevin. Right. So, uh, in terms of outreach, there's a there's a, a 10 June. There's going to be just some Girl Scouts out of Wolcott Mills. Riyadh's going to support that. This is a hold a date. The astronomy at the beach is going to be on this year. It's the 16th and 17th of uh, September. So again, hold those dates. Um, uh, the eclipse uh, party that was going to be here got rained out. So, um, and the only thing that, that we, we only had uh, there was only three people who were going to support it from the from the club. So what I've been doing is sending uh, sending notices out to kind of a, a group of about 17 people that have um, generally supported things like this. So what we'll, what we'll try to do next time is if we send out a request like that, and Mark, and Mark suggested this, it's a good idea. And if we don't get a lot of feedback, we'll just, you might see any, a blast email just looking to support events like that so we can get more people involved. Um, and uh, that's, that's it. Thank you, Kevin. And Mr. Dale Timi is joining us from Florida. Dale, can you broadcast? Yes, I can. Did you hear me? Okay. It works. Well, hello, everybody. And uh, happy to be able to participate in the meeting, even if I can't do it physically. But uh, the WASP is online, and, and we're uh, putting together the next uh, issue. And I want to reiterate again that uh, we are looking for uh, images for our next calendar. I would like to get that thing pushed out the door in time that uh, we don't have to get murdered by the postage costs. And that'd be my report. Thank you. Good point. Thank oh, you. Also, David. David Levy's in the house. I see. Yes. And so. I popped him up. So, since we have the ability for the WebEx participants to talk to us over the PA this time, let's have some observing reports. And I know Dr. Levy had something he wanted to say last time around and didn't get to. So, take it away, sir. Think you're on mute. Yeah, thank you all. Um, anyway, it's really good to be here at this hybrid meeting. I wish I could be there at the in person part but I have to do it from here. Anyway, um, last time I was gonna remind everybody about the very big and exciting meteor shower that Wendy and I went out and observed. The meteor shower that wasn't. Um, we went out, we had a good night, we sat outside in a nice warm sky, and I saw, and Wendy saw 18 meteors. So it wasn't too bad. And that, but it was not 18,000 or 1,800,000 meteors. It was not a success in that regard until I woke up. I think you went on mute again. Lost your audio. Del Timmy, can you say something? You hear me now? Yeah, no, now we can hear you now. We got okay, good. Anyway, uh, it turned out that the or my camera caught five meteors, that only one of which I actually saw, and two meteors were on the same image. Anyway, so I'm working on getting those together, but uh, for now, I will just offer you a poem, which I thought of last night. I was looking at the crescent moon. It is by Percy Shelley, and it's a fragment to the moon. Art thou pale for weariness? A chosen sister of the spirit, and Jesus, one day, one day, it speaks. And that's a fragment to the moon. And back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levy. All right. Who else has an observing report? We'll take WebEx first since I can see all of you on the screen. Uh, I know we had a couple of things that were underwhelming, like the meteor shower that really wasn't and the lunar eclipse that got clouded out. But we also have a planetary alignment in the morning. Has anybody had a chance to see that one? 
Anybody in the audience, go ahead, stand up. Yeah, we had five planets visible in the morning sky on the third and the fourth, which hasn't happened in quite some time. Um, I didn't see it myself. I slept in. But. Anybody yeah. see anything cool? Well, I've got pictures of that Jupiter Mars when it was at the closest. I have it that I've posted and shared. I've also got one Tau Herculid or whatever it was called. Yeah. In a in a meet in a uh, Milky Way shot at Lake Hudson. Nice. That's my I, report. I went out to look for the meet, for meteors and it was up early in the morning and I went out and about four o'clock I was looking and I saw a flash. Now I'm thinking it was a, a plane. Continue looking at that spot, waiting for the next flash, which never came. I saw no streak. It was just a oomph. So head on head on meteor. I, it could be. I'm not sure if it was though. Neat. So one thing that I'd like to uh, promote to y'all, um, it's not a WAS event, but it is a star party of note, is Stella Fane, the Springfield Telescope Makers Visual Observing Only Star Party in Springfield, Vermont, is coming up at the end of next month. So it's going to be that last weekend in July. Jonathan and I are checking it out for the first time ever. Um, Jim Shedlowski did a very good presentation on it several years back after one of his visits, um, really talking it up. Uh, if you are interested in doing Stella Fane, book now. They are running out of rental cars in the entire state of Vermont. <laughs> Which you think they could ship more cars in. But anyway, so rental cars are already a problem. We're two months out. Um, we didn't have a problem getting a hotel room. Uh, we, I'm not a camper. Uh, but if you want to do Stella Fane, uh, go ahead and, and book it. Sooner rather than later, especially if you're going to need a car. Any other um, observing reports or star party reports for the good of the club? Well, then, I think it's time to introduce our short talk speaker tonight. You've already seen him up at the podium. It is our professional astronomer, the guy who does the behind the scene work for the Vatican Observatory. That's right, the Pope's own astronomers uh backdoor guy the uh guy doing the hard work behind the curtain mr robert tremblay our first vp take it away bob thank you hi everyone all right let's make sure i can share this properly let's see slideshow All right, you guys uh, seeing that? We're seeing it. All right. If you could use it, the okay. stream is into my hearing okay. aids. Okay. Right there. That work? You can either use it, okay. or, or you can, or you can clip it. There you go. Thank you. All right, first time I've done presentation in a while. Um, okay, so let's get that out of the way. There. Okay, I should have made sure I can I just close that. With the, the middle one. There. Or that, yeah. there we go. Okay. Every 10 years, NASA and its partners asks uh, the National Research Council to say, hey, what are we going to do for the next 10 years? And these guys come up and they prioritize the research areas, observations, and they make uh, mission suggestions. So it's a 10-year plan outlining the scientific goals. Um, it's a summary of input from a bunch of scientists, which I'll be showing you at the end. And what, what I didn't know is when I started doing research on this, there's three different, or actually there's four different uh, decadal surveys. I'm going to be covering the planetary science one, but there's uh, astrophysics and astronomy and earth science, and there's also heliophysics. 
So the National Academy of Sciences was created in 1863, uh, created to advise the nation. And they are the ones that uh, their, their website hosts all these documents talking about all these things. Um, so, but before there was a decadal survey, um, there was things like this, uh, the space uh, science in the 21st century from 1995 to 2015. Um, what they what they were suggesting was a Galileo like mission to study Saturn, which we had with the Cassini, Uranus and Neptune, and eh, we didn't get that, and a mission to rendezvous with Saturn's rings, that would be really cool, eh, we didn't get that, and a study of Titan, well, we kind of got part of that with Cassini, it did some cool things, but it, a Titan orbiter would be very, very cool. Um, study of the moon, a lunar geoscience orbiter. Well, we kind of got that. That's why I yellowed that. We have a lunar reconnaissance orbiter. It wasn't doing a whole lot of geoscience. Um, network of lunar rovers, we don't have that. Lunar sample return, we have not had that. Mercury orbiter, we did get that with uh, the messenger probe. Um, and it did do a little bit of solar study, but not as much as the uh, not as much as the uh, survey here or this pre-survey suggested. Um, a program of extensive study of Mars, uh, Mars Pathfinder, which went there, and Mars Sample Return, which you'll see is like put in every one of these and hasn't happened yet, and has continued to be planned. A flyby of a comet or Apollo asteroid. Uh, we have flown by several comets and asteroids and gotten a lot of pictures of them, and that is very, very cool. Um, okay, so the first decadal survey, uh, 2003 to 2013, um, there's a whole, notice all the red things. These are all the things suggested that didn't happen. We did get uh, in New Horizons, the Pluto Explorer and the Kuiper Belt uh, flying by uh, Arakoth. Uh, Mars has got a whole lot of stuff, and Mars is completely inhabited by robots right now. Uh, the Jupiter Polar Orbiter, Juno, which we have, and probes, which we didn't get, so we got part of that. But all these large class missions, Comet, Cryogenic Sample Return, Mars Sample Return, there it is, Mars Sample Return, Neptune Orbiter, and Uranus Orbiter, we didn't get those. And uh, Europa, and this is where we started to get a lot of interest in Europa, but we didn't we didn't see that in the 2013 one. From 2013 to 2022, the last one, a uh, new Mars rover, that would be uh, Perseverance, which we got. Uh, Europa, mission to Europa, we're in the process of uh, getting that on, on uh, for the next one. Um, that would be uh, the Europa Clipper. A mission to Uranus and its moons, which we didn't get. And uh, the Mars rover uh, proposal was called Max C. This was its original name. It was uh, collecting samples and and pooping out the little uh, sample return things, which would later come uh, uh, with a Mars sample return. But medium missions, we only got the Trojan tour, and that would be uh, oh heavens, come on, what's the name of that mission? I can't remember the name of it, it'll come to me. But we didn't get any of the other ones. And again, Comet Sample Return, IO Observer, Lunar Geophysical Network, I saw that. That was pretty interesting. This is something that actually Gary Ross, in, my, in our, at our first picnic, he was talking to me about how angry he was that uh, the Apollo 17 uh, seismometers were shut down and how we really, well, how much, how much data we would get from a lunar geophysical network, and well, we didn't get it here. And here's South Pole uh, Icon Basin sample return, Saturn probe. Well, okay, we 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 didn't really get a probe. I mean, it, the one we had burned up. We didn't get any useful information from that. Uh, Trojan tour. This is what we've got going on now. And I'll remember the name of that mission in a second. Venus in situ explorer. More 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 Venus stuff. Again, we didn't get that. So. This is the latest uh, planetary science decadal survey. This will go until 2032, and it identifies, again, priorities and opportunities, makes funding recommendations, and it's going to cover planetary science, uh, a lot of astrobiology, and planetary defense is something that is new in this survey. Um, the highest priority mission, Uranus Orbiter. And I was actually, I, we, my wife and I have an after school astronomy club, but I was telling the students 
a, about a month ago how angry I was that we've never sent anything back to Uranus and Neptune, right? And how all these surveys suggested it that never happened. And like two days later, this came out. I'm like, yes. So, and this is the highest, this is on the top of the list this time rather than a secondary or you know tertiary mission so it's likely that's going to happen and i created this image using space engine for uh uranus and kerbal space program for the, the spacecraft uh probably four years ago so yeah i've been wanting this for a while and i know heidi hamill was very happy that uh, they're doing this she was on she was on the, the previous decadal survey that recommended it and didn't get it so the second highest priority mission is the Enceladus Orbilander. That is a great word, and I hope to hear it a lot more. Orbilander, it's a mashup of orbiter and lander. So we're gonna orbit that thing and land on it. That will be very exciting. Second priority. Um, some of the uh, concept missions, which probably some of these are gonna be the red ones, Centaur Orbiter, Centaur, these are asteroids, or probably more like cometary bodies, that have a periapsis or a semi-major axis out in out in the outer solar system. They generally have unstable orbits, and the one the one pictured here is uh, Cherlico, I believe it's pronounced. It actually has rings around it, so it'll be very interesting to, to orbit and land on that thing. Ceres sample return. This would be uh, very very cool. Ceres is the large, rather icy-ish uh, body in the, in the asteroid belt where it shouldn't be. So yeah, it would be very interesting to get a sample from that guy. Comet surface sample return. You'll note this has like been in every single one of them and also the cryogenic comet sample return. We'll see if that happens. That'd be very cool. Enceladus multiple flyby. I'm not sure how that meshes with an Enceladus orbital lander. Maybe if they can't because an orbiter and a lander is a lot more expensive than a multiple flyby. So maybe if they can't do one, they'll do this. Again, these are concept missions. Lunar Geophysical Network. Um, this is pretty darn cool. The concept is uh, they're gonna have four of these things that launch at the same time uh, in the same payload, and they're all gonna land pretty much at the same time. They don't go into orbit first, they come straight down in and do a suicide burn. So yikes. So that'd be very exciting for those guys handling this mission. And I'll be covering more about this at a later presentation. Saturn probe going into the atmosphere of Saturn to uh, explore it. Titan orbiter, that gets a vote for me. I, I really want to see that. And there's also, um, uh, they're, they're planning on a, like a Volkswagen sized helicopter to go to Titan. So maybe that could hit you right on that because I saw a video on it. They've got the whole payload. They just don't have a launch vehicle right now. Venus in situ explorer. I was kind of hoping Jonathan would be here because I'm sure he'd be he'd be loving to see that. Hopefully this doesn't get axed again in another one of the red ones. But um, they're planning on uh, a lander and with an, uh, a, a balloon in the atmosphere. Again, I'll be covering more more detail of this later. Um, planetary defense. I am I am so happy that they're including this and they're going all out and in including this too. They're not taking. They're, I mean, they are taking this very seriously. Uh, they want to increase tracking and characterization capabilities. Uh, one of the things is an uh, infrared satellite called the NEO Surveyor. Um, this is very similar to what the B612 Foundation wanted to put up there. Um, again, infrared finds asteroids better. Developing uh, technologies for NEO deflection right now, we've got the DART mission, the Double Asteroid Redirect Test, which is going to be sending uh, an impactor into the smaller of uh, a, a binary asteroid, and they're going to check, they're going to see how much they change its orbit. And it's only going to change it by like 0.3 millimeters per second, and they can measure that. So it's crazy. So um, methods to prepare for better short warning time NEO threats. I remember in 2013 when Chelyabinsk blew up over Russia, this is Charles Bolden, and uh, about a month later, he was uh, uh, at a meeting of Congress, and they asked him, well, what can we do about these things? And he said, if we've got three weeks' notice, pray. Well, that's not a very good strategy for planetary defense, so hopefully they're going to do something about that. Um, 
Arecibo, oh, the video during Iron Doll. I had video of it collapsing there. Um, when Arecibo collapsed uh, in December of last year, it was a major blow to planetary defense. And ooh, next page, please. Thank you. The uh, National Science Foundation has recommended a replacement of uh, the, the ground-based capabilities lost, lost with Arecibo. Now, this, this, this quote I have at the top here in yellow, this is from the director of uh, Arecibo. He's saying, we don't have another facility or telescope that can replicate that, and we don't even have a suite of instruments that can replicate what Arecibo did. The only thing out there right now that's even comparable is this half meter, uh, I'm sorry, this 500 meter aperture uh, radio telescope that's in China, and that's gonna be problematic for our scientists to use. And I am not sure if uh, the quote in, in blue there from, from Francisco is uh, a, we need to have something bigger than theirs, but he's saying essentially it, we should surpass what they have if we're gonna be replacing it. Um, scientists say the replacement for Arecibo could cost a half a billion dollars. And I, I think it's money well spent personally. <laughs> So exploration programs, uh, maintain Mars exploration program. Look at all those missions, all the ones in the past. Yikes, that's a lot of them. Um, all the current ones here, um, pretty much um, per perseverance is on the ground, Mars sample return. We'll see if that happens, that's planned. Um, they're, they're in the planning stages on that. ExoMars might be having an issue with what's going on in the Ukraine right now. Insight is probably going to be wrapping up pretty soon. It's already been uh, extended and its solar panels are covered with dust. So MAVEN is still in the atmosphere. It actually just recovered from a safe mode event uh, that lasted several months. Mars reconnaissance orbiter going strong. Curiosity rover going strong, but losing its wheels pretty darn hard. I saw a, a post on social media today. Its wheels are getting chewed up pretty bad. So uh, Mars sample return, yeah, I'd love to see this. There's a lot of different methods, uh, ideas for this, but I, the, the plan is to go collect the samples that Perseverance has uh, dropped on the surface, collect those, put them in this, and get them back to Earth. Now, whether that rendezvous with something in orbit or comes direct, we don't know yet, but we'll see. Prioritize the Mars Life Explorer. Now, this was news, it's uh, to seek extant life and access modern habitability. But my question, I actually wrote the people that wrote this report and I asked them, what happens if life is found on Mars? Uh, now, you know, Star Trek and, and a lot of science fiction says, well, you can't go there. That's, you know, that you, know, you can't screw up their environment. That's their planet. So what about human landing and colonization of Mars if there's life on Mars. And if there's life on Mars, we're gonna to wanna to study that, right? So how are we gonna do that? Well, obviously on Mars in situ, but what about bringing samples of that life back? So I went up and I asked my elderly mother-in-law and I said to her, what if we found life on Mars? How'd you feel about a sample return mission to return that life to Earth? And her look was, like that, so that that didn't get a, a vote of confidence from her. So yeah, I said, do if we find life on Mars, would would you return that to Earth? How do you study that? So interesting question. State of the profession. This is something new that they've added in. Uh, they're adding in diversity, equity, and uh, inclusively inclusive. God, I can't talk tonight. And accessibility. <laughs> Um, they're implementing codes of conduct. I'm not really sure why they're putting this here because JPL already has a code of conduct, but they're doing it across the board. Again, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the documentation on all this and what they're talking about is pages and pages and pages long. So I have condensed the heck out of this. So similarities to the uh, current, uh, the, the prior decadal surveys, I, you know, identification of the research targets and that kind of stuff figuring out missions, working out costs and stuff. Um, now, the key distinctions in this one, the uh, greater emphasis in astrobiology and planetary defense. Yay, I'm very happy about both of those. Um, and uh, th th this is interesting. Report organized.
by significant overarching scientific questions rather than by destinations. I remember when Pluto, uh, when the New Horizons flew by Pluto, a comment I saw on social media was that we have now explored all the major bodies in the solar system and we have entered into the second phase of solar system exploration. And I wondered what that would look like. Well, here it is. We're now, we're looking at questions rather than destinations, which is pretty interesting. So what's the process? Well, here, 500 white papers, a ton of panels and steering groups, and just, just tons of meetings, 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 meetings. And here are the people that did this. You might recognize some of these names, but a lot of different uh, high power institutions and folks. And we've got a renowned social scientist uh, putting her word in on this. And uh, there's some vice chairs. We've got a whole bunch of stuff going on but paul brine venus i follow him on twitter yeah he's constantly posting stuff about venus so if you're interested in excuse me if you're interested in checking out more information on decadal surveys you can go to this link uh science.nasa.gov and just search search decadal survey and you will find tons of information on it so with that thank you very much any questions yes I understand why you know, Carpenter and Lander and Enceladus is high priority stuff. Why is a mission to Uranus higher in priority? Hmm. Well, we've already got the uh, uh, Europa Clipper, which is which is going to be searching for life, the, the signs of life, habitability. Um, I what I would have to look at the documentation because, like I said, they they went through a whole ton of procedures on figuring out why one would be better than the other. The reason they're not going to Neptune is simply because there's no good launch window in the next ten years and that kind of stuff. But I can find that out for you. Okay. Yes, you're okay. That's. Oh, they found them on Europa too. Knowing what I know, see something like Obviously, they've got reason. I don't have an answer for that. I can find out though. I could I could ask the scientists directly because I've got all of their email addresses. Yes. Yes, that is that that that's one of the future Venus things. Um, I'll be covering that in one of my future presentations on this. Yeah, there's actually two missions going to be Venus. Uh, I'm actually, um, <laughs> I came up to get my coffee refill the other day in my basement, and my mother-in-law is watching. Oh, she watches documentaries like crazy, but she was wide. They were talking about those future missions to Venus, so that was pretty cool. Came up today, and she was watching something on Osiris Rex. She goes, "My mother-in-law is very cool." Any other questions? All right, well, break time. All right. Uh, thank you. Reconvene at what, 8.30? For our main presentation and go have a snack break. Do here. Is everybody else? It work. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah. What? What? Without this, <laughs> well, that worked.
the deal. I was accepted with pride. It's a way to say pride. And it's screwed it up. I can connect this WebEx and share it. Okay. But it could be off the loose. Stay in there. Find for Dale. Why did they choose um, over Enceladus? Uranus. Bob, let's be Mike's. Okay.
Unmute. Hello, testing, testing. Test. All right. Testing, testing. All right. All right, people are taking their seats here. Not that, this. Okay, welcome back. Um, our speaker tonight is Peter K.G. Williams. Uh, he is a scientist at the Center for Astrophysics uh, and the American Astronomical Society is also director of the AAS Worldwide Telescope Project. His astrophysical uh, research focuses on the magnetism of stars and planets, large surveys, and the techniques of radio interferometry. Um, he's he's going to be talking about the Worldwide Telescope, which is both a web app and an installable app. And I've been using it every week in my posts for the Vatican Observatory Foundation. I I've been covering Messier object recently. I'm including a link that takes you right to that. Uh, yep, the, it. If you're familiar with Stellarium, yes, it has some of that capabilities, but boy, is that about that much, the application's that big. So I am going to let Peter take it away and tell you all about it. Okay, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? All right, um, thanks for that introduction. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm not sure, I'll keep an eye on the WebEx here and the chat. Uh, if people in the auditorium have questions, um, I think I'll, I'll leave it to you to figure out how best to get them to me, but I'm certainly uh, very happy to answer questions as I talk. Um, so go ahead. Dale, do we have to let him share? Uh, I should be able to share. I'm not sharing yet, um, but it worked before. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk for just a minute or two before I started up the app and started showing you around. Um, yeah, so my name is Peter Williams. I'm the innovation scientist at uh, both the Center for Astrophysics, uh, Harvard Smithsonian. I'm based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and also the American Astronomical Society, uh, the major scholarly society of professional astronomers in America. Um, so what I mostly spend my time on is uh, managing this worldwide telescope project and other projects where we're basically, uh, my specialty is trying to think about ways that we use technology to help astronomers do their research uh, better and faster. Um, you know, technology construed broadly is transforming everything we do. Um, but actually, you know, a lot of, a lot of astronomers uh, might be professional scientists, but uh, they don't necessarily know anything more about computers than you do. Um, and uh, there's sometimes when having some specialist knowledge really helps out a lot, and that's where I come in. Um, so, yeah, I will start sharing and start showing you the Worldwide Telescope application. Just going here. So, uh, the way that we like to describe Worldwide Telescope is it's a tool for showcasing astronomical data and knowledge. So, essentially, uh, like Bob said, it's uh, a school uh, tool for visualizing the sky, um, like Stellarium. It also has a sort of Google Maps type interface uh, for the sky. Uh, but what we really focus on is the ways that visualizing astronomy data in this kind of realistic environment lets you understand data and uh, use those data to explain astronomical concepts. So, okay, let's start the sharing here. Actually press the button correctly. Um, so hopefully you are seeing a screen of an application with a few different uh, buttons and, and panels going on. Uh, so this is the main view of Worldwide Telescope, uh, which yep, actually is good, um, yep. which uh, starts out in a 3D view of the solar system. And um, so I'll pan around here and hopefully you can see the orbits of uh, solar system planets. And I should mention that often when I'm showing WWT, uh, over a technology like WebEx, it might look a little choppy, uh, but on a computer where you've got a decent graphics card, it's really super smooth. And uh, a lot of effort has gone into, uh, there's all sorts of fancy 3D programming going on here that allows us to do some really neat stuff, which I'll help show you in a bit. So this is our default view. Uh, so I can sort of click and drag to navigate the solar system. And uh, at the bottom here, uh, hopefully you can see me mousing over there's some 
uh, little icons that let me highlight, you know, well-known planets. So if I click on Earth, we'll start zooming into Earth. Um, fly through the sun to do it. And one thing that I want to point out is that uh, this is a scientifically correct view uh, to the best of our software's ability. So for instance, right now in uh, Massachusetts where I am, you know, it's getting dark outside. It's, it's evening, but it's not nighttime. Um, and indeed, uh, that's sort of here's the Terminator and here's where I am. If you can see my mouse cursor, uh, this, is, this is, you know, a good approximation of the Earth's current position and orientation right now. Um, one thing that you might notice is that we have this nice cloud map here, and you can sort of see if I zoom in, uh, the data of the Earth are actually tiling in. So we have the same kind of high resolution visualization capabilities that you have in something like Google Maps, uh, even for the Earth. Uh, so if I try and zoom in on the Boston area where I am, it gets very sensitive in this mode. Um, but we can zoom in and get mapping data. Oh, and so the Earth is moving because the Earth is actually moving in Earth's orbit. Um, so if I go to, uh, if I pause time here, the Earth will stop moving uh, because, uh, so this clock right now is showing, you know, the current time um, where I am right now. And by default, if I let time move forward, uh, this is the 3D view of the solar system you can actually perceive the Earth's motion in its orbit. And, you know, if I leave it here for an hour and come back, the Earth will have moved on because it's moving in its orbit. Um, this is an example of how the solar system view, a lot of work has gone in to make it based on our best available uh, scientific data. You know, stuff like the Earth's orbit is extremely well known. Um, but there's other fun things, like, say, if I zoom us over to Jupiter, We had a question, are the clouds real time? Uh, those clouds are not real time. Um, so it is possible to, um, I'll just flip back to Earth quickly. So over here in this left menu, if I expand Earth, um, so you can see we have these different cloud layers so I can uh, turn them off and they'll fade out here to our default map. Um, so this is a very built in, you know, built in, very nice, uh, I think it's 8K resolution cloud texture that just looks very good. Uh, but you can do things um, using a system called WMS, which um, if I do this, can you see a dialog box that's popped up or not so much? I'll take that as, as a not so much. Um, yeah, so, we can see it. Okay, uh, so there's this WMS system, which is a web mapping service, which is a way of downloading uh, earth science data on the fly. And WWT uh, can explore WMS, uh, where there's this service offered by NASA called Gibbs, which has a whole bunch of uh, WS data built in. And many of these are real time or fresh uh, data for all sorts of things. That are, so you might be able to, if you can see this dialogue, there's things like sulfur dioxide and cloud fraction and amphibian richness. Um, so I'll try adding amphibian richness as a layer and uh, you can see that things have turned green. I'll turn off the clouds to make that a little bit easier to see. Um, so this is some mapping data of, I guess, something about how many amphibians are around the world. Um, but this is an example of the kind of like corner of rich functionality that WWT has, uh, where it's added all sorts of uh, really neat capabilities over the years. And I believe there's WMS stuff that gives you near real-time cloud information. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, you know, this is visualizing over the entire uh, sphere of the Earth, and it's just hard to get data that actually do that. So, um, you know, the limitation is much more in terms of what kind of satellite coverage is actually available and what's publishing stuff in real time. Uh, but many data sets like that are available using this w WMS uh, system and we can display them. Um, so I'll get rid of the amphibians. Um, yeah, uh, so I was also going to show with Jupiter. So here, um, 
This is obviously not a real time map of Jupiter. We wish he had those data, but not quite. Uh, this is a nice uh, composite mosaic. And um, what we can do is we can add satellite orbits. And this whole nest is showing orbit lines for uh, many, I don't know, don't want to claim all of the known uh, satellites of Jupiter. So if I go to uh, this thing on the left, there's a list of all the named ones and then there's so many that people gave up on giving names and there's some symbolic thing, uh, symbolic indicators for the more recent ones. Um, but so these data are drawn from a data file that we serve online and can actually download uh, and update when new moons are discovered. Um, this file has been updated particularly recently. Um, but it's an example of the cool kind of data integration that we have where everything that you see here, uh, when you install a worldwide telescope, it's only like a hundred megabyte download or so. Um, and everything that we see, we actually pull down from the internet on the fly, uh, which is really important because like that map of the earth that we have where I can zoom in and see individual houses of Massachusetts, um, that's probably a few terabytes of data. Um, our default map of the sky where you might be able to see Orion in the background here, uh, that's about a terabyte of data. And uh, really a lot of the technology in Worldwide Telescope um, is relating to being able to pull down uh, all of these astronomical imagery uh, on the fly when you need them as you're exploring things. Um, for, and the, just, uh, for the satellites, the uh, are Earth satellites also mapped there or just the moons? Uh, yep, I can show you some of that. So I'll zoom over Earth again. So, so this is looking a little bit funky because we can see everything all at once. So let's scroll down here and turn off those and that should tidy things up a little bit. Um, so see here by default, we show uh, our friendly moon's orbit um, in this menu. So by default, uh, there's only one other orbit which is added, which is the International Space Station, where this will uh, probably take a little while to download. Um, but we actually download up-to-date real-time information for the ISS's position. Um, and so let's see if I need to remember how to actually do this correctly. Uh, Another thing that I need to turn on for. There we go. Uh, so we can set up worldwide telescope to actually uh, track the orbit of the ISS, uh, which is happening right now. And we also have this million polygon ISS model, um, which there we go. Uh, so this is the ISS in all of its detail in its proper orbital position um, as it orbits the Earth. And, you know, down to individual, you know, holes and whatever antenna or whatever this is. Um, once again, this is the sort of uh, cool feature that, you know, WWT has pull, uh, acquired over the years. Uh, but you can also add orbits uh, for other satellites. Um, so, um, so we have this concept of layers or sort of these different graphical elements that get added and uh, you can add a reference frame uh, using uh, different ways of like TLE data, if you're familiar with that for uh, artificial satellites um, or natural satellites, uh, demarcating where they are. And then you can do things like associate, you know, just render that orbit or you can even associate a 3D model with it. And so you can, you know, uh, like Bob's uh, rendering of the, of I think it was the Venus mission. Um, uh, you can create those own your own things in Worldwide Telescope by that uh, by adding orbits and importing three D models and doing all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, we try to have a lot built in so that you can just explore and have fun without needing to really get in the nitty gritty. But if you want to create uh, fancy visualizations, um, there's a lot of tools that let you do that. And this actually comes from Worldwide Telescope's background as uh, this is software that can drive a planetarium, um, including, you know, multiple projector, multi-million dollar kinds of setups. Uh, I'm definitely not going to show it here, uh, but there's all sorts of ways to uh, set up Worldwide Telescope to run in a multiple computer dome configuration and calibrate projectors and 
Uh, so like the Adler Planetarium has used Worldwide Telescope to show, uh, to produce and show planetarium shows. Um, or it can also run in like a portable inflatable planetarium where you've just got a laptop with a projector and a spherical mirror. Um, it'll, it'll work in all that whole range of use cases. And uh, we have a bunch of, um, so we call them tours in Worldwide Telescope which are kind of scripted experiences which you could play back at the planetarium show. Um, or uh, so you can create those or you, we have a library online that you can download from. Um, and if I have time, I'll show a little bit of that because that's one thing that uh, is really great about Worldwide Telescope is it's pretty easy to create tours. So if you want to um, create something educational where you, you know, say start here and, you know, I guess I'll, I'll get into it, why not? Um, so if I go to this menu and start creating a new tour and type something about my tour and give it a name and it's sort of a slideshow based model. Uh, where I can create a slide um, based on the current view. And then each slide has a sort of duration that it lasts. So in this case, it's saying that it lasts 10 seconds and there's a start position for the camera and an end position for the camera. And uh, the slide interpolates smoothly over that time. So I can maybe zoom out, move the camera around a little bit, and then I can say, all right, this will be the end position of the camera for the slide. And if I play back this show, this slideshow of one simple slide, it will go from where I started to where I ended in this 10 second little zoom. And then maybe I can create a new slide from there and zoom way out. And I'll make that the end camera position of this slide. And so now if I play this, we'll do that 10 second pan and, and zoom again. And then once that 10 seconds is done, we'll do a much more rapid pull out to see uh, a lot more of the earth for this slide that I just created. Um, this is definitely not gonna be a super like helpful introduction to creating tours with Worldwide Telescope, but the point I wanna get across is that it's pretty easy to uh, create these. And uh, you know, even school children um, can sort of get the hang of it and start creating some fun effects. And if you've ever used any kind of similar planetarium software, Often the tools that they have for uh, creating visuals are are a lot more complicated to say the least. Um, and over here, you might see that we have some controls where I can like overlay text, and I can add a message um, to the screen, and I can add shapes and pictures, and you can even add music and a pre-recorded voiceover. Uh, so you can create a sort of whole fancy production. Um, in a sort of PowerPoint like uh, environment that is, I would certainly say is, is, you know, takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's way easier than a lot of the alternatives out there, especially for the quality of effects that you can create um, relatively easily. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the 3D mode. So it starts with a solar system. And so I'll just get out of the tour editor for now. Um, one thing I showed before was pausing time. Uh, we can also unpause time and make it run faster. So if I hit this button a few times. So what's happening here is I'm following the ISS and its orbit in this really awkward view. So that's gonna make everyone dizzy. Um, so let's, uh, let's go to the sun. And so if I speed up time a lot, now we can start seeing the planets orbiting in their orbits. And, you know, we're moving into August and September. And, uh, you know, again, this is, you know, pretty good, pretty good accuracy calculations of the actual positions of planets as time goes into the year 2023 and beyond. Um, and, you know, you get a great appreciation for Kepler's laws of, how fast you know these little moons are orbiting, or how fast the inner planets are moving compared to the outer planets, which at this time scale, you know, we're moving a million times faster than real time now, um, and still this motion is is imperceptible here. Um, while we're looking at the solar system, one fun thing to add is another example of real scientific data that we have incorporated um, is asteroids. 
So if I turn this on, we add a bunch of dots uh, for different kinds of asteroids. Um, so these ones that you're seeing here mostly are like outer, and there's also the asteroid belt. And then if you're familiar with, um, so Jupiter has these Trojan asteroids, which lead it and follow it in Jupiter's orbit at about 60 degree di difference. They're kind of stuck around Lagrange points. Um, and so this is the kind of thing where, you know, we have for each asteroid, we have an orbit, but we're not exactly doing like a full gravitational integration. So if I play time um, fast enough, you know, these kind of decohere and smear out where it's really uh, gravitational effects kind of keep them trapped in, uh, in these uh, Lagrange points. So this is not really realistic and that's kind of, you know, there are limits to the uh, realism that we can have in this software because we're just using your graphics card to calculate these positions. Um, likewise, if you want to, you know, use WWT to calculate asteroid trajectories, it's not going to give you meter precision um, because we're actually using your GPU to do the calculations and there's limited precision there. Um, but it is really cool to uh, see the asteroids, and once again, this is a data set that we update periodically and that WWT downloads on the fly. Um, if I start zooming out even more, so we can eventually leave the solar system. I'm using my mouse's scroll wheel here to just zoom out and out and out. We can start seeing some 3D positions of nearby stars. And eventually uh, we start showing an artist rendition of the Milky Way. So this is the only artist rendition in all of our blood telescope. Obviously we don't have a picture of the Milky Way from inside the Milky Way. Uh, so what we have here is a composite of uh, based on, um, you know, measurements of the Milky Way's spiral arms, plus um, imagery of, I don't know what, but a galaxy that we believe um, looks a lot like the Milky Way and then some kind of, you know, 3D representations of the galactic bulge. Um, if I zoom out even farther, we eventually, we eventually get to the cosmic web as posed as uh, diagnosed by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, so this is a 3D map of galaxies from, I think, DR7 of the Sloan Survey. So these are galaxies where the red shifts are just used um, to get an approximation of their distance. And uh, if you're familiar, you see the sort of strange structure in the Sloan data um, where, uh, you know, obviously the screen should be entirely full of galaxies, but Sloan was only able to look in certain declination and RA bands. And so the data that we have have these uh, very distinctive wedge structures. Um, and this is the kind of thing where if you're showing someone who's not very familiar with astronomy or astronomical data, um, you really have to make sure to explain what's going on because um, people can get all sorts of uh, strange ideas of they see an artifact in the data and they take it very seriously. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people really, a lot of what we do when we try to explain astronomy with Worldwide Telescope is explaining that the data are not perfect and that there are uh, artifacts and, um, you know, when you have a trillion pixel map, uh, you are not going to be manually able to fix all of those ourselves. And so, um, and so, you know, there are things like, no, we don't have a real time map of Jupiter because we're not getting those data. Um, and, and we are, whenever possible, we do want to stick to actual astronomical data. Um, so this is all the 3D view of worldwide telescope and, um, so we can explore different planets. And one other thing I'll show you is we'll zoom way into Mars. So uh, we have some great Mars data sets. So I'll turn off the asteroids and things. Um, so in particular, I zoom in here. One thing that we have is we have elevation data for Mars. Uh, so I can actually Um, all right, my keyboard isn't doing what I want it to do. Maybe this will work. 
So I'm trying to show is that we actually have 3D elevation information. So you can zoom in and uh, get a sense of the height of the volcanoes and the depth of the canyons. Um, I'm having trouble showing that right now. Uh, but you can see uh, it takes a little bit of while to zoom in for the Mars data set, uh, but we do have high resolution data for the entire surface of Mars and some very high resolution data for uh, select parts that are covered by high rise. Um, if I go to this explore menu, we also have, so in the top here, it's sort of access to the WWG data collections where we have a built-in collection of right now, it's around 4,500 different data sets. And uh, once again, these are stored on the cloud and the internet, and you can download them on the fly as you need them. Um, so for instance, I can load up different maps of Mars. Uh, so here's one, uh, okay, now I know what I was doing wrong. Uh, so here's one where it's colorized based on terrain type. And so I think it should work. If I zoom in to Velas Marineris here and use, yeah, use my controls here, uh, you can see a little bit of, we get the topography um, from this elevation data which again, we're downloading it on the fly, so it takes a little while to kind of uh, pull in the details. Um, or what else do we have? Um, this is, so this is, uh, we have a lot of, a lot of the maps, you know, there's some maps that are designed to be pretty. There are some maps that are designed to be scientifically accurate. Uh, this is uh, Themis infrared data uh, from Mars Odyssey which obviously does not look nearly as cool um, as, the, as the colorized maps, which you can sort of see them when I mouse over. Um, but this is you know, real data that researchers are using for understanding, honestly, I have no idea what the infrared Mars surface imagery tells you, uh, but we've got it in there. Um, another fun thing for Mars is, so uh, I've showed you the solar system mode Right now we're in the planet mode uh, where it isolates things to a specific uh, planet. So if you can see the menu that I've popped up here, we have imagery for Mars and you know, all the planets in the solar system and also some fun things like Io Europa, uh, some of the moons. We also have a panorama mode. Um, so here we're looking on the outside of a sphere and uh, being able to zoom in and navigate. In panorama mode, we're basically on the inside of a sphere. Um, and so we can pull up uh, panorama data from some of the Mars uh, rovers, which you see here. Um, so this is uh, from the Perseverance mass cam. So we get nice uh, high resolution imagery of the rover itself, taking a little selfie and also um, some of the, I think this is like a billion pixel panorama so, you know, I can really zoom in on some rocks here and, uh, you know, get a really beautiful view of some of these Martian rocks. Uh, or I think the Van Zeele one, I think, is kind of the best. Um, yeah, we can see the rover tracks. Once again, you can, you know, zoom in and see pretty much every little clump of dirt that the rover has stirred up and also cliffs off in the distance. Um, I think this is from Desero Crater, if I remember correctly. Uh, so, you know, this is a little bit of a specialized mode. Honestly, it's sort of added because it uses the same technology that we have for showing astronomy data, um, but it is just incredibly cool to be able to explore these high resolution panoramas. Um, is that a rock or is that like a piece that must be, okay, that's, must be some piece of debris from uh, the landing or something, maybe. I don't know. Um, and down here, you can see we also have uh, panoramas from the Apollo landing sites. Um, there's a whole collection of um, fun panoramas from uh, different worlds out in the solar system. Um, and so, Besides that Earth and planet mode, uh, the one that I actually use the most as an astronomer is our sky mode, uh, which is kind of a Google Maps for the sky uh, kind of interface. So by default, 
Um, our mode is our sky map here is a composite of the digitized sky survey. And uh, once again, as I said before, this is about a trillion pixels of data that we pull in uh, from the sky. So here you can see Orion. If I zoom way in, might recognize cool nebula that a lot of us are familiar with. Um, and I can zoom in and down here, uh, this is called the uh, context pane, where in this mode, it shows me images in WWT's database that are near this position on the sky. And unsurprisingly, there's a lot of data for the Horsehead Nebula that people have gathered over the years. Uh, so I can click on and load up different images that people have, uh, have published about the Horsehead. Um, and so these are often different filters or emphasizing different features. Um, here's a nice one. So in this particular case, you know, we've got probably, you know, almost a dozen different horse head images um, for other popular astronomical, uh, you know, the famous, the crab, things like that. Uh, we often have dozens of images available that you can load up. Um, so besides the sort of click and zoom interface to the sky, uh, we can use this uh, explore menu at the top to explore in a little bit more systematic way. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we have collections of images from different well-known satellites or observatories. So, say Hubble, that's a pretty famous one. Um, if I click on Hubble, we can load up, um, we have a folder of images put together for Hubble's 30th anniversary, which are uh, some of the absolute best ones, I think. Um, so, here I'll load up uh, what's called FAT, the Panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury. I think this is about a 12 billion pixel map of a large chunk of Andromeda, um, which is put together by the folks at Space Telescope Science Institute. And once again, you know, if I zoom in and just keep on loading more and more and more stars, um, you know, down to pretty much individual pixels where uh, I think this image has, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say order hundreds of millions of individual stars uh, that you can measure and explore as you uh, check out the data. Um, and so this is one thing that Worldwide Telescope does really well is it lets you explore these huge images really down to the individual pixel. Um, and this is something you know I see a lot where like more and more uh, people, astrophotographers, you know, from amateurs to professionals are creating maps that are huge, maybe not in terms of sky area, but in terms of having billions of pixels. Um, and there's just really not a ton of ways to actually appreciate all that data. And the sort of pan and zoom interface that we have in a worldwide telescope uh, really, I think, is the best way that we have to be able to do that. Um, and data like this are just, you know, absolutely incredible. Uh, so you can see the mixture of, you know, older or lower mass redder stars and bright blue ones and dust lanes and, and all the structure that makes Andromeda an incredibly cool galaxy. Um, or we can check out the Whirlpool Galaxy. This will be another uh, Hubble mosaic. And so one of the effects that we have is WWT is navigating over here gradually um, so to give it time to download the data so that we get a nice smooth experience. Um, so once again, this is a great Hubble mosaic where we're emphasizing the dust lanes and star formation um, in the Whirlpool. And this one is not quite as high resolution as the FAT data set, uh, but again, I can zoom in and see the incredible detail um, in these absolutely awesome Hubble images. Um, so besides looking at these sort of what we call studies, these specific images in the sky mode. We also have a whole database of sky maps. Uh, so if I click on this button down here, hopefully you can see a menu of, I said this default view is a digitized sky survey, uh, but we've got a whole range of them. So for instance, uh, here I'll load up the VLA low frequency sky survey. So this is what the sky looks like um, at, I think, 100 megahertz, maybe 80 megahertz radio waves. Uh, it's very different. 
Um, and this is another example of where data artifacts are a huge factor. Um, so the sort of waffly pattern that you see here is an artifact of the interferometric inf imaging that we do with a very large array, um, which you may be familiar with as a telescope from contact um, or one of the telescopes from contact. Um, and so, you know, sort of our perception of the radio sky is just very different than, uh, than you get in the optical sky, but the sky itself is also different. So we have everything from low frequency radio to, I can pull up, uh, here's a map of the sky in hydrogen alpha, uh, where the uh, structure of the galactic plane really comes out in a uh, really cool effect here. Um, so we have all these bubbles and structures associated with star formation. Um, I can pull out ultraviolet uh, from the GALAC satellite. We're here, uh, you know, this is a lot of the sky, it isn't the entire sky. Uh, so we have a sampling pattern of the different places where GALAX looked. Um, but this is how the sky looks like an ultraviolet. And so, uh, for instance here, so I'm looking at Andromeda and I can say, pull up this image of Andromeda in the infrared, and then I can use our crossfader to fade it out and compare the infrared and ultraviolet. And, you know, we'll see that sort of the bright parts in infrared are the UV dark parts more or less. Uh, that's not surprising. Um, and you'll see that, you know, there are some sources that are bright in both, um, like that right there. And there'll be others that, you know, you'll really only see in one band or the other. Um, and this kind of overlaying images taken at different wavelengths, um, you know, is, I think it's cool overall. And as a researcher, uh, that's you know, often really essential for understanding what you're looking at when you're looking at extended structures like galaxies or nebulae or, you know, star forming regions, um, which, you know, as an astronomer, my science, often I'm just looking at a single point and being able to understand the imaging is actually not the most important thing for me. Um, but if people do things like researching star formation or galactic structure, um, being able to combine data from multiple wavelengths all in their sky context is uh, super duper important. Um, what else do we have? You can also pull up the sky in gamma rays. So this is from Fermi, uh, where, you know, so this is high energy, uh, you know, I think many MEV uh, energies of, of photons, uh, where the sky, once again, looks very different. Um, I think that most of these point sources, um, I think it's a combination of pulsars and AGN probably. Um, I think a lot of the galactic ones, it turns out that finding pulsars and gamma rays is a relatively efficient thing to do. Um, and so once again, if I go up to our collections, um, the built-in data sets. So we have even more all sky surveys available um, in this folder mode. So I can walk through and there's different radio surveys, uh, like a radio survey that actually likes somewhat more is called the first survey. That's more useful for the science that I do. Um, or once again, the, uh, the pattern of, of the sort of waffling that you get from the VLA. So the VLA is this array of radio telescopes in a Y shape. And through the magic of interferometry, that means that you get the sort of hexagonal pattern around everything that you see. So when you look at VLA imagery, you often get this sort of hexagonal waffle effect. Uh, so this year, we released a new version of the Worldwide Telescope Windows application and other pieces of Worldwide Telescope, uh, collectively under the banner of the 2022 edition of Worldwide Telescope. And uh, one thing we added is support for a uh, standard called HIPS, which is another way of um, sharing all sky data over the internet. And that's basically given us hundreds of surveys that we can also uh, now visualize in Worldwide Telescope. Um, many of these are you know, designed for research purposes, and so they're not necessarily visually appealing, um, but they are the data sets that, um, actually, that's not a good choice. They're data sets that uh, researchers are using for um, discovering, you know, whatever work they need to do. 
So if I load up this IRAC one, that might be, oh, no, that's not gonna be a good choice either. Um, trying to find one which actually has good all sky coverage, which can be a challenge. All right, so IRS, IRIS. Um, so this is reprocessing of data from the IRAS telescope. Uh, where I've made some very bold color choices here. So the galactic plane is mostly blown out, uh, but we can see um, and explore this data set of infrared uh, imagery. And the colors here will correspond to the infrared colors of objects of different objects. And this kind of structure here is one of these large scale data artifacts um, that, you know, we'll have people look at worldwide telescope data and they'll see a telescope glint and be like, I've discovered a spaceship. Or, you know, I've discovered some kind of rays that are emanating out from the North Pole. Um, and we have to explain to people that they've discovered data artifacts. Um, so while you're exploring the sky in this way, uh, we have a feature called the Finder Telescope, where if I right click on something like Andromeda, um, we get some information and uh, we can pull up menus. So things that for instance, we'll look up uh, this location in the Simbad service where, um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, Simbad is a database uh, maintained by uh, the European astronomy community, basically of all the interesting astronomical objects uh, that are out there. Um, and they have, they gather all sorts of scientific measurements like magnitudes and positions and proper motions. And, you know, they have lists of what are all the papers that have been written about this object and things like that. Uh, or I can look up associated publications on ADS, um, or I can pull up specific image files. Uh, so the finder scope is really useful and you can drag it around and it will, uh, we have a database of sort of the most common objects in whatever fields of view you can look at. Um, and uh, yeah, there's even more. So let's see, how are we doing for time? I think, I've been showing this app enough where I'll just mention a couple of other op features that we have. Um, so we have VR support. So uh, if you have an Oculus Rift VR headset, you can uh, boot up Worldwide Telescope in our VR mode and do things like explore the solar system with uh, 3D mode. I do want to warn you, this is the kind of thing where, you know, game studios have millions of dollars to work on developing the interface for this kind of stuff. We don't quite have those resources. Um, so it's, you know, not, not always the most polished experience. And um, there's a lot of stuff that we wish we could do uh, that we simply don't have the resources to implement. Um, so there's not every single VR feature you could hope for, um, but we can do that. Uh, we can also do things like you can import your own 3D models. Uh, and so, for instance, if you want to make a tour that shows Where's Osiris Rex going? What's its, or what's its orbit look like? Uh, we have um, we have uh, tutorials that sort of explain how to get the data in there, and we can load those in and combine them. Oh, and also uh, this telescope menu. Uh, so Worldwide Telescope, you can actually connect it to an actual physical telescope using the ASCOM protocol, um, or I should say that I really have no experience um, in astronomy with, you know, actual telescopes that you hold. I command the very large array from afar. I don't know anything about the night sky. So um, I don't know how common or popular ASCOM is, um, but uh, I know that it, it, so it is a system that lets you control, a, uh, you know, home telescope or even a major telescope from your computer and Worldwide Telescope can use ASCOM. Uh, so if you install an ASCOM hub and have it all set up, you can say navigate to a part of the sky in Worldwide Telescope and slew your actual physical telescope there at the same time. Um, so you can even use it while you're observing to you know, get an idea of, of what you wanna look at and, and drive things that way. Um, we also have, uh, because Worldwide Telescope is used in planetarium domes, you can do things like plug in a MIDI device and use MIDI knobs and controllers to, uh, to build custom uh, controls for controlling the view. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's too much to show now, uh, but if, especially if you're um, 
trying to sort of do a custom experience, you can script things in all sorts of ways. We can write different software that actually scripts the Windows application. Um, I saw something pop up in the chat, but I let's see if I can pull up the chat right now. I don't. Know. Um, cool. Uh, all right. Uh, does it include database, Earth orbital objects, satellites, and debris? Um, yeah. So our built-in database doesn't have that particular stuff, um, but you can add those items and there are ways to sort of add lots of orbits at once um, so that you can uh, uh, you can you know add say um, there's a group in China that does a lot with worldwide telescope they actually have a customized version of the application that uh, is ported to Chinese language and they've uh, recently done a feature of using worldwide telescope to visualize um, satellite swarms like Starlink and showing what the effect they have on um, on uh, astronomy viewing. Um, so you can load up that kind of information. And that's really um, the thing that I really wanted to touch on was you know, all the data that we have here are coming in from the internet and pretty much everything is configurable and updatable and addable. And one thing that you know, I really want to encourage in particular this audience to, to you know, hopefully play around with is you know, your data you can get them into Worldwide Telescope and you can share them. And so I've just been showing you the Windows application, uh, but as Bob mentioned, we have the whole uh, web version of Worldwide Telescope. And I think what I'll do now is stop sharing the Windows app and start sharing my web browser and show a few things relating to that. Because um, there's really some really cool stuff with, you know, we can help you share images if they're, you know, even really big or or just you know something that you made that you're happy with, um, we can you know help you share that in this kind of uh, fancy interface with what I think is a pretty uh, simple system. So I'll stop sharing that. Start sharing this. Um, so hopefully you're seeing a web browser window now. Uh, so right now I've got us on the Worldwide Telescope homepage, which is worldwidetelescope.org slash home. Um, yeah, we're seeing a web browser. Great. And so if I click launch the web client, uh, that takes us uh, right to our web version of the Worldwide Telescope application, uh, which might look very familiar. Um, because it's a really pretty close uh, copy of the Windows app in a lot of ways. It obviously doesn't have the features that let you drive a planetarium dome or, uh, you know, use 3D glasses or whatever. Um, but we have the same data and the same web browser interface that lets you uh, explore in the sky mode or, say, 3D solar system mode. And uh, there's a lot of... Um, uh, you know, you can do most of what you can do in the Windows application, this web application at all, uh, with this web application without having to install anything at all. Um, and so if you just go to worldwidetelescope.org, it will bring you to this web client. And then if you click through the main website, um, and importantly, worldwidetelescope.org slash download will take you to the screen to download the most recent version of the Windows application. Um, but that's not all. So we also have a website called embed.worldwidetelescope.org. Um, and this will guide you through using the Worldwide Telescope web application uh, to create your own little Worldwide Telescope view. So for instance, um, if I click here to show an image, uh, we have an integration with astrometry.net, which uh, I bet some of you are familiar with at least. Uh, Starentry.net is an amazing service where if you, if you upload an image of the sky, um, any image of the sky, it can figure out its plate reference, its astrometric solution um, mag quasi-magically. Uh, under the hood, what it does is it sort of looks for triangles of stars, and uh, it has a brilliant algorithm and a brilliantly designed database of kind of all the major triangles of stars in the sky. Um, where you can throw pretty much any image at it and it will use that geometry uh, to figure out where you're pointed. And so for instance, if you have an image that you've solved with astrometry.net 
I like this example here. So this is an image of the horse head. Uh, all you have to do is, um, so astrometry.net has a built-in connection to Worldwide Telescope where you can view your image in it. And we have a little hack where I can copy that link. I can paste it here. And uh, we can create a little viewer that shows that image um, in a Worldwide Telescope uh, viewer. And so I can either open it in a new window. I think this particular image isn't actually loading for some reason. Um, or we have HTML code that you can then use to uh, embed. So, you know, right in this little window here, oh, there it goes. It just took a little while to load. Um, in this little window right here, we've got the full Worldwide Telescope application essentially. And you can, you know, the way you might stick a YouTube video inside a web page to show a video, um, you can use Worldwide Telescope and put it in a web page to show off an image or a tour um, or other things. And so right here, you know, the way that you create a web page with this is you use this HTML iframe tag. And so we give you the magic tag that you need in order to be able to show off an image there. So this is what it looks like when I, we have a sort of streamlined interface uh, for this version where I can do something like cross fade this image in and out, or I can change the background data. Um, so I can show the horse head against this low frequency radio data imagery again. Um, and so if you have a really big image, uh, this embed version, um, it's basically the way it's designed. It only works for modest sized images, like say below a few tens of megabytes. Um, but we've put a lot of effort into building tools for image processing um, that let you, if you have an image that's a billion pixels, uh, you can share it online in Worldwide Telescope in this kind of slick pan and zoom interface in the same way, um, as long as you have a place to upload data files. Um, if you wanna learn more about that, you can go to docs.worldwidetelescope.org, uh, which is our documentation hub. And uh, so we have a package called Toasty, which is a data processing tool. And in general, um, a lot of this stuff is really, you know, you do need some level of computer knowledge and computer programming in order to uh, make the best of it. But we're always happy to help people um, share their data. You know, that's, I think, a thing that the web version of Worldwide Telescope is really great for is it gives you a way to share your imagery in a way that's so much more exciting than kind of a JPEG box on, on the static website. Um, and so we're always happy to help people figure out how to do that. Um, and we've got a lot of other documentation about uh, creating tours and adding layers. And then there's a whole different programming layer of if you're a software developer, um, this web application that we have can be scripted with standard web technologies. It's implemented in TypeScript. Um, you can create whole applications uh, based on um, using sort of Worldwide Telescope as a toolkit under the hood. Um, so if I have here. So for instance, uh, here's an educational project uh, created by a group called the WWT Ambassadors, uh, which uses a sort of simple Hubble law exercise where it has an interactive view powered by Worldwide Telescope. And then you essentially measure the heights of galaxies uh, as a very lame proxy for distance. And we know what their redshifts are. And you can use that to sort of explore Hubble's law a little bit in a very basic way. Um, and this is like, I love this because this is like a very slick looking, cool web application that was created by a couple of you know, astronomer educators who are not web developers at all. Uh, they just have a good design sense and we're willing to you know, learn a little bit about HTML and JavaScript. Um, but you know, I helped them a little bit with putting this together, but surprisingly little, uh, they, they did it all. And that's the real powerful, you know, that's the power of the web in a nutshell is the fact that you can create like a slick app application like this uh, amazingly easily. Um, with something like Worldwide Telescope to do a lot of the hard work of pulling in all the image data and all that. Um, all right, so I've been talking for a very long time. Um, so I feel like I should uh, pause here. So I'll leave up, say,
our download link, worldwidetelescope.org slash download. Um, if you want to download the Windows application, or you can just go to worldwidetelescope.org and play around with the web client and get some of that experience there. Um, hopefully, uh, this has given you a taste of what WWD can do. And once again, I really want to emphasize that I think, you know, you know, you can use Worldwide Telescope for education. You can use it for astrophysics research. Um, you can use it just to enjoy the beauty of the cosmos. Uh, but also, if you're an astrophotographer, um, we really want to help people use it to share their data in an exciting way. Um, so if you're all interested in that, um, you know, please get in touch. We try to have a lot of documentation, but there is a lot of stuff that needs to happen to, to get things working um, often. So um, I'm more than happy to uh, help you play around with it and see if you can get your data in and, and use it to share data with other people. Uh, I think that's one really cool thing that we can help out with. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there and uh, take any questions if there's um, still ones in the audience. All right, any questions from the audience here? Yes. I just had how much memory and did you have to use about RAM or I don't know if you heard that uh, the, the question from the audience was what kind of computer are you using right now? Are you running it on? How much RAM processor? Right. Um yeah, so it's uh it's it's not unusually like it will run well on uh any kind of modern machine and even uh, older laptops at this point are plenty fine. Like, you know, the more memory you have, memory is usually not the limiting factor. If you have more than a few gigabytes, that should be enough. Um, the graphics card is an issue um, where, again, modern, you know, a, a standard laptop that you buy these days, um, even a sort of integrated graphics card uh, can power WWT just fine. If you want to do high end work for a planetarium with like, you know, 8K displays, that's when you need. A really good uh, 3D card to to get the best results, um, but for instance, the you know the the web application is running in your web browser using WebGL technologies, and it's you know far from the most efficient system, but it works well enough. Um, so yeah, the actually the um, when you're exploring things in the Windows application, um, it's downloading everything on the fly and storing that. So you know you end up sort of accumulating gigabytes of data of what you've checked out on your disk. So you can actually, um, if you're really going nuts, you can start running into disk issues, but then all you have to do is to throw stuff away. Oh, I see a question um, from earlier uh, about does this work on Mac? And so the Windows application is only on Windows. The web uh, application will work on Mac and Linux. It can run on your phone. It can run on the dashboard of your Tesla. Um, that's another beautiful thing about working on the web is it makes Worldwide Telescope available in a whole range of, of places. Um, and for researchers, uh, that includes running inside Jupiter. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Jupiter with a Y computational environment, uh, you can use Worldwide Telescope there. And that's sort of our recommended way to run it um, for cross-platform research needs. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Does the infrared mode work for the Earth? Is there an infrared shot of the Earth? Um, let me check that. So I know that you can go to solarsystem.nasa.gov and, uh, I'm sorry, eyes.nasa.gov and it will have eyes on the Earth. It has a whole bunch of uh, Earth science data and they do have an infrared there. They've also got CO2, carbon monoxide, so it's pretty impressive. Yeah, so I'm looking at our database and we don't have an infrared map. Um, we've got the blue marble image. We've got actually uh, street maps, open street maps. Um, but yeah, so if that infrared map is available as one of these WMS uh, data sets, we might be able to show it that way. Mm -hmm. And in general, like a lot of the work that we do is finding cool data sets. And um, the way that WWT works is Sometimes all you need to do is basically add a little um, uh, data file that sort of tells Worldwide Telescope where to find the data, and that's all you need. Um, sometimes you need to process the data to get them into the right format so that uh, we have some, you know, we can show several different uh, 
uh, data formats, but sometimes people choose weird ones. And so if you want to display something that's in a weird thing, you might have to, you know, reprocess, reproject all the data, which is a much bigger issue, but we can get a lot of data sets in just by um, essentially updating. We have a little database of different data sets. And so, uh, you know, pretty much at this point, every month we're adding new images, mostly sky images from observatories. But um, we have a guy who works for us at the Space and Rocket Center in um, Huntsville who has been getting a ton of cool planetary maps. So we're adding like new maps of a lot of, uh, I think we recently did some Saturn moons and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, so yeah, we can, we can add data sets pretty easily in most cases. Okay, any other? Yes. Uh, well, any information from the uh, web telescope that you put on this? Uh, well, information from the James Webb T Space Telescope we put added to this. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, th that's the kind of thing where, uh, you know, as the web team publishes images, um, what we'll do is we'll essentially, um, you know, pull them down and integrate them into Worldwide Telescope. So uh, there's a standard called AVM. So um, you may be familiar with like, if you're an astronomical researcher, your data are usually in a FITS file and the FITS data contain uh, what we call WCS information saying, okay, here's where they land on the sky. Um, there's an AVM standard, which allows you to do the same thing for just like JPEG files or TIFF files. Um, so if people publish data with those AVM data, we can pretty much slurp them right into Worldwide Telescope automatically. Uh, if they don't, then there's a little bit of, you know, we have to solve, uh, get the plate solution somehow. And we have several tools that allow us to, to get things in that way. Um, but yeah, the, actually the, the limiting factor that we're running into is we have this kind of folder explorer band. And when you have thousands of images, uh, it just becomes really hard to find stuff that way. And so we're actually thinking about sort of how we evolve the interface to allow people to actually, um, you know, find data in useful ways, just cause, uh, the folder hierarchy that we have um, gets a little unwieldy at that scale. Uh, but yeah, we are absolutely going to be, uh, you know, we're, we, you know, we try to work with the space telescope people to ideally even have things in worldwide telescope as they're initially released. Uh, but sometimes we just chase after them and pick our favorite images and, and pull them in there where um, once you know, the tools, it's something you can often do in 10 minutes uh, or less is, uh, get something processed and upload it and uh, we can make it available to people. All right, well, we're at 9.30. Um, let's everybody thank Peter and uh, go home and play with the application because it's cool. Peter, I have a question for you. Uh-huh. So I, I enjoy uh, imaging some of the moons of the planets, and I like finding smaller and smaller moons. Uh, and I've imaged Amalthea and Thebe before, but I typically use a program like Stellarium to make sure I'm not looking at a star and confusing it. And I found that Stellarium's data for anything less than the four Jovian moons did not seem, didn't seem to match the JPL data. And the JPL data is, is, um, I haven't found a good application for actually visualizing that very well. It was a, it was antiquated method and so forth. So uh, this looks like a great app. If, if it has accurate data for stuff, it looks far easier to help me visualize that. Do, do you get that data from JPL or? Yeah, so um, so when we have these databases of moons, um, I believe that um, I, I haven't done that. I, just, I haven't done that stage of the data processing. So I don't know whether JPL publishes um, TLEs or spice kernels or, or how they, what format the data come out in exactly. Okay. Um, but yeah, so if, um, you know, the way that we store orbits for things is we reduce them to kind of like a Keplerian element six, you know, elliptical orbit uh, definition. 
And so, you know, when things are moving chaotically over long periods of time, you need to update those numbers to yeah. get things that are fully correct. Um, so for instance, our, our moon orbits will be recent as of, you know, a few years ago. Um, and I don't have a sense as to whether that is sort of accurate enough for your needs. Okay. Um, but we also, our documentation does include um, tutorials on how to take spice kernels, which um, are sort of like, you know, the, the ultimate underlying extremely high precision uh, orbital data that JPL generates and um, plot them in Worldwide Telescope. There are features that will let you plot a trajectory um, based, you know, you, could, you have to do a little bit of uh, processing, uh, but you can generate a trajectory, trajectory from that and get that in there. And so that should be um, accurate pretty much to the precision of WWT's rendering engine, um, which again, if you're trying to see like, are two things gonna hit each other at 10 meter precision, it's not good enough for that. No, no what you're I talking just, about, Dale, I Dale, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we have a room here at Cranbrook, so we do have to break things down here in the physical part of the meeting because we've got staffers who are here just for us. So we're gonna start shutting down as long as Dale Teamy leaves the chat room open, y'all can keep going, but we're just saying good night from our end. And if y'all want to come and talk astronomy at the Redcoat Tavern, Woodward, just north of 13 Mile, we're gonna be there. Very sorry you can't join us. <laughs> that is, uh, normally we take our speakers out to dinner. So um, anyway, good night from Cranbrook. Keep the party rolling on your end. Thanks. All right, have fun. I can keep the uh, chat room going here. Uh, I, it doesn't have to be that accurate. I just, you know, typically when I'm looking for those moons, like, okay, so is it far enough away from the planet that I can actually see it where it's not lost in the glow? And Stellarium, sometimes it it has it on the wrong side of the planet. I mean, far away. It, it's probably old. We can only.